Okay, so we're gonna talk about this word, curation. I was counting, I was in the audience all morning counting. I figure I get a dollar every time everyone says that word. I did very well today. But before we talk about curation, I wanna just ask a question. So there's a lot of you out here, some of you are from New York, some of you are from around the country, and I wanna do kind of a quick poll. How many of you, on an ordinary day, the last thing you do after you've kissed your family goodnight and you've had dinner and you've petted the dog and you've watched TV, the last thing you do, you check your email. Please raise your hand. Okay, it's a little bright up here, but I'm gonna say that some of you are not telling the truth. Okay, it's still about two thirds. Now the question that you just have to, this web is about transparency, we're gonna be a little transparent here. How many of you, in the morning, before you've taken a shower, before you've had your first cup of coffee, the first thing you do is check your email. Okay, now look around. That's a really terrible thing. And we should all be really frightened. And the thing is, this is a publisher, this is a thoughtful room of people. This is a group of people that should be able to say, you know what, I'm gonna put some of those things aside until I've had a cup of coffee. But the answer is no, you don't. And the reason is, we are overwhelmed and you all feel it, and what you've said until today, and I hope you leave remembering this one thing, oh, it's because of my job, it's because of the industry I'm in, it's because of the tumult in the book business, it's because of something, but, but not everyone's going through this crazy, overwhelming information overload. Guess what? Your authors are, your customers are, your readers are, your kids are, we all are. And it's not sustainable. It's kinda like this. There's a great big haystack and the stuff that you're looking for is getting infinitesimally smaller. Imagine a thousand, yeah, all right. See, this is a smart room. They go, no, 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 we can't do the haystack analogy. It's beaten to death. All right, let's try a different analogy. There are these trees, and the forest is getting bigger. See, they like the, the analogy, but they don't like the images. The editor's saying, eh, you should do better. Okay, we'll do a high-tech version. Signal to noise. The signal is tiny. The noise is overwhelming. Pick whichever analogy you want. What we all acknowledge is that what we're faced with, what we're struggling with, is an information overload. And the result of this, for all of us, for our readers, for our customers, for our partners, is when there's too much noise, we simply do this. And that's what we're facing today, is the volume of things coming at us. And by the way, I'm, as you'll find in the next few minutes, far from a Luddite. I think this is awesome. I think it's wonderful. I think we're living in the renaissance of ideas. I think this is exactly what we want to have happen. We're just missing the tools to sort it. So the things that we actually get to pay attention to are the things we want to pay attention to. So the good news is curation is going to solve that, and I'm going to give you some examples of how. But first, we have to kill search. So let's do that right now, shall we? Some of you have Wi-Fi connections. We're going to play this game at home. If you have Wi-Fi, go and search on your name. I'll do the one that I did last night. Took my name, I typed it into Google, and this was the result. Now, what's interesting about this is there are a bunch of guys on that screen, for sure. So I'm gonna go ahead and just, we're gonna give Google a little hand here, and I'm gonna take all my actual pictures of me off the screen. Now, did you notice that not half the screen went away? More than half the screen got left up there. Now, let's give Google a little bit of credit. There's some guys named Steve Rosenbaum besides me understand that they can't figure that out. But there are women up there. And the thing that upset, you know what? There's a woman named Steve Rosenbaum. It's a little strange, whatever. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is this. <laughs> there is a Pomeranian named Steve Rosenbaum. Now, this is very funny, except for the fact that part of why we use search, part of why your readers and your authors and all of us use this appliance is because we're trying to find things that actually matter. So imagine you and I have never met, and I've got a book proposal, and we're meeting in a Starbucks, and you go to Google and type in Steve Rosenbaum, and you walk in looking for a Pomeranian. Because you're thinking, I'm gonna sign an author who's a dog, how awesome is that? And instead, you miss me. So this is actually, the good news is, that what's bad for search is good for publishers. And I, I think I'm gonna make an argument of how that works. Now, the first thing I wanna be clear about is the guys in Mountain View, who I happen to think are very smart, they get this, right? I mean, this is a quote from this August in which Eric Schmidt made very clear that from the beginning of time until 2008, there was five exabytes of data created. And we are now creating that amount of data 
every two days. So A, you're not alone, and B, the guys in Mountain View get it. But at the end of the day, the good news for all the human beings we're sitting with is I think the problem doesn't get solved by algorithms. Because algorithms only can manage things that have tags associated with them, and they don't do, they don't do qualitative work very well. I'm going to show you how. So let's, let's assume that we're beginning to work on a project. I think back to when I was a kid. Now, one of the things I've learned about being out in front of you is that I have an obligation to be a little transparent. So I'm going to share with you a couple of things in this presentation. And one of them is that I was a magician. This is me at 14. I had birds. Don't ask, it's a long story. But I, in order to be a magician, if you were a magician, you shopped at something called the Tannins Catalog. And the Tannins Catalog was this extremely awesome treasure trove of stuff, pages and hundreds and hundreds of pages that looked just like this. The problem is nobody said, this magic trick really doesn't work. And this one really sucks. And so as a magician at 14 years old, my job was to go into Tannins, find the magic, figure out what was good, talk to other magicians, and put together a show. And if you watched my show, it was really different than everyone else's show. Same source material. Imagine that the magic book is simply an, an analogy for the web. It's the same collection of stuff, only the way I organized it and presented it was different than the other kid who was presenting at the Elks Club down the street. I like to think for my time I was pretty good. It was a lot of fun. Flash forward, and you take that kid and that catalog, and you end up with a very different feeling and a very different performance than the one that everyone else did. So, so curation is the art of finding, sorting, organizing. Now, some of you are going to push back. If this were a debate, you'd say, no, isn't that just editing? Clearly, it's not editing. It's something very different. There are pieces of book publishing, pieces of television programming, pieces of computer programming, pieces of lots of different arts all coming together into this new craft called curation. And, and here's an example of how it works. So imagine you're working on a cookbook, and you're trying to put together a delicious, healthy series of menus, and you put together these three pictures. Now, as you can all see, they have a theme, they're gardeny, they have green, they look good, they're healthy. Now, let's flip the page. Now we're gonna put, put together a set of desserts. Mmm, delicious, color pink, lots of yummy food, lots of sugar. You take these same images, and instead of curating them, you organize them a little bit haphazardly, the way the web might organize, say, Google News or something that's organized by a computer, and you get this. So this is what the public is getting when it goes to the web and it searches for delicious dinner recipe. Without one of you, without a curator, without a human getting involved in helping to solve this problem. Now, this is bad, right? This is the antithesis of editing. But the fact of the matter is that the current noise that comes in your inbox is actually worse than this. It, it looks something like you put in a search term and you ended up with this. <laughs> now, this is really profoundly disturbing. And the sad thing, of course, is this is going to be the thing you remember. For, you go, oh, that was the guy with the weird tattoo picture. Sorry about that. But, but you wanna, people don't want to be exposed to things they don't want to be exposed to. They want, I mean, you counted on me to do a better job of curating images that were going to be presented to you than that. You're like, hey, that guy showed me something I didn't want to see. It used to be that content was king. And this was a phrase that got thrown around all the time. It was very, you know, content is king. Authors are the, you know. The problem with the idea of content is king is that in a world in which everyone has abundance of access to bandwidth, devices, publishing tools, blogging, et cetera, all of a sudden, there's an unlimited number of kings, and they become demoted, and all of a sudden, you're replaced with curation. Curation becomes king, content becomes prince. The question is, who is this person wearing this crown? And what excited me about listening for the last two days, although I believe that when I came in the door here, I leave even more confident that the kings of this next iteration are book publishers. A and I'm going to be quite specific about why I'm not saying television networks and why I'm not saying movie studios and why I'm not saying web companies, but book publishers. And it really comes down to what a book is, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there in a moment. Um, my curation journey began two years ago when I wrote a blog post in which I said, can curation save media? 
And you know, I, I, I think it was a reasonably well-constructed, puzzling question. I put it up on one of the websites I write for. And I looked back in a couple of days and found that lots of people were reading it. And then three months later, lots of people were still reading it. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And so I began over the course of the last year and a half to write occasionally about curation and begin to explore. And then it became clear to me, you know, one of the things that's funny as an author is that you think, well, someone smart's going to write this. I mean, there must be somebody better skilled than I to put this together. And then as I began to look at the number of people that I was talking to and the number of interviews I was doing, it was clear to me that actually no one else was writing it. And so I went out on this journey, interviewed 70 people, some of these folks you probably know, Ariana Huffington, who just as of last week, depending on how you look at it, either was purchased by AOL or bought AOL. Isn't really clear. Um, but, but each of these people, from their different disciplines, whether it's John Miller from News Corp or Clay Shirky from NYU, had very strong, passionate feelings about curation and what it was and what it wasn't. And so as I started to pull together all these ideas, I was struck by the fact that what I was really doing, in addition to writing a book, was curating. I was picking people to talk to, I was bringing them in, I was asking them reasonably well-formed questions, I was editing their thoughts into a story that had a little bit of a journey in it, it was kind of entertaining. And so when I was done, I had this thing that we all know and love called a book. And I will tell you, and this is something very, very important, as a many year old blogger and a first time author, two things I've learned from this process. One, editors are a pain in the ass, and B, God, I love editors. Because the thing I delivered to them in August, I was convinced was, I thought they were going to correct the spelling. And after three sets of reviews and a lot of pushback and a lot of conversation, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I wrote a better book, despite all my whining, than the book that I wrote originally because it wasn't published instantly, because it wasn't self-published, because it wasn't published by me in my room without looking at anybody, because other humans were involved in the process. Now, the challenge that I think comes out of this conference and that I think is really interesting is how do you take the process of publishing, make it more electronic, make it faster, make it more efficient, and keep the human piece very much in place so that readers understand that there's a difference between something that's self-published, something that I do in my overnight and publish the next morning as a blog, and something that goes through a, bu a book publishing process. And I would argue that one of the things that's worth thinking about and that I'll be thinking about is how you explain to readers going forward that this thing has a different experience around it. This thing has a different level of complexity around its construction. So it, at the end of the book, I was left with two questions. And I'm going to actually now take you guys on a journey um, that I hadn't really planned, but I think just two days ago I decided it was important. So the first question is, what is a book? And the second question is, who is an author? And while I've heard a lot of theory and a lot of discussion about how much we love books, I'm actually going to take you into a book and a project for a second. So I need to ask one more question. How many people in this room are not from New York City? Excellent. So it's essentially almost everyone. Two thirds, more than two thirds. The next question is, how many of you have gone down and seen the World Trade Center site? It's also a big number, it's interesting. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a personal story and excuse me if we, this is, this is a fun story in the end but it takes a little bit of a journey. So in order to understand what a book is, you have to ask yourself, is a book an idea or is it a story or is it a thing, is it a type of media, is it something specific? And on September 11th, 2001, I began making a film. I became convinced that there was a story to be told. Some of you may know the film. It got a lot of good recognition. It was called Seven Days in September. And it was, in hindsight, though I didn't know it at the time, the first thing that I did that was really curated. I put an ad in a New York newspaper and said, if you've seen 9-11, I'd like to see your video. And then I gathered up hundreds of submissions. And then I chose 28 stories. And I brought their video in. And I recorded my own. And I made a film that played in theaters and played on television, played on A&E. And I was convinced I was done. I, and I, and by, that, by that definition of what is an X, you all know the answer to that. I'm a filmmaker. Good. Period. Full stop. But then something changed. I realized I had 500 hours worth of material. I had the largest 
archive of 9-11 video in the world. So I became a curator. And really, the more I held on to this material, and the longer I held on to it, the more I realized that it deserved to be part of the World Trade Center Memorial that's now currently being constructed down at the site. And so I went to the people that were building the museum and I said, I have this material and I'd like to trade it. And they said to me, trade? What do you mean by trade? And I ended up giving them the educational rights to this archive, in exchange for which they gave me the rights to tell the story. And so I'm going to take you on a journey in about three minutes into some material that no one has ever seen in public before. This is the story. This is the story of redemption. It's a story of rebirth and renewal. And let me just explain that one of the things you may not know is there are two totally different things being built down there. There are memorial pools, which are extraordinary. And then there is an underground museum that will be one of the most traffic places on Earth when it opens in 2012. So this fall, you're going to see the memorial plaza open on schedule. And a year later, you're going to see the museum open. So Every time that I'm down there, I take a, there's, this is a, a clock on the wall, which by the way, uh, they, they will tell you was a gift from Mayor Bloomberg. When your boss gives you a clock, that's not a gift. Um, when I was down there on Friday, it said 212 days remaining. Everyone looks at it every day. One of the things that you probably don't know is there's an enormous hangar at JFK. And JFK has in this hangar all of the artifacts, all of the material that has been gathered up from the site, and they're now choosing which pieces of it will go to the museum. It's an incredibly emotional, I've been there 15 times, it never stops haunting you, just the size of the place and the amount of material that's sitting there. But the thing about the story that I'm so passionate about are the people, if you could imagine 30 people or 20 or 10 of the finest human beings on Earth who've given their lives to build this thing, you couldn't imagine better people than the people that are down there every single day struggling with this story, trying to figure out how to tell it, dealing with all the questions. Because you know what your historian friends will tell you is that history doesn't begin for 20 years. You can't call it history until 20 years has gone by. So here they are having to build the penultimate story of 9-11 10 years after it happened. It's an enormous, enormous burden and craft. And so if I were to come to you and say, hey, I have a project and I want you to see some photographs, you would probably say to me today, if you were a book publisher, oh, photos. Well, the photo book folks are down the hall and we call them gift books. And by the way, we really don't make any of those anymore because they're just too damn expensive. So, all right, well, he here's a photo, but watch what happens if I click it. And is this, where is this located? Kind of it's busy in church. So some of it is at the site and some of it is it's leaving the site. If you, look, if you listen to most of the video, if you listen to the ambient sound relating to the, the impact, there are two things always on the soundtrack. One is the boom of the plane and the other is everybody yelling, oh shit. I think that there's not a whole lot of space in this exhibition for oh shit, nor is there a whole lot of space in this exhibition for the boom. So, so the point is that we're looking for some other, uh, something, something else besides those things which is more meaningful. So now we're puzzled, right? So wait, it was a photo book, but it has sound and motion and pictures of things that someone's going to write about and tell a story. So is it a, f now on the iPad we know the answer to this, right? It's all of these things. But in the world we come from, publishing, which is it? Which door does it enter in? So I'm going to show you one more page of photographs. So this is the actual waterfalls. These are going to be the largest man-made moving water in the United States when they open on September 11th, 2011. And they will run continually, winter and summer, from that point on. What you see up on the right-hand side are the, the mock-ups that were built at the Brooklyn Navy Yard of this massive water. And on the bottom, what you see is one of the walls. The water will drop off the sides where the names are and then down into this parapet. And here again.
So the question is, what is a book? What is an author? If I take video and I write words and I take pictures, what am I? If I put together a story using these, all these new modern tools that we all have in our purse or our wallet or our handbag or our briefcase, what does an author look like? This is an interesting question, and it's meaningful and it's important. What I'm convinced and what excites the hell out of me and the reason I came to see you all today is that at the end of the day, curation is the magic that glues these things together. It says, wait, that deserves to be a movie, that deserves to be a photo book, that deserves to be something entirely different that people read and experience. And, and, and what I know, because I'm looking out and seeing your faces, is there's not a person in this room who doesn't say, you know what, I actually, I need to see more of that. I need to understand more about who those people are around that table and what they were talking about and how that material got gathered. Well, that's, fr from a publisher's perspective, from an author's perspective, what you want are audiences that say, I want to experience that. So, the question is, is it a book? And, you know, I wanted to just end with one little bit of technology. You know, we've gotten so excited about the iPad, it's worth an rem reminding us all, it's not even a year old, right? It hasn't had its one year birthday yet. So all of a sudden, all these things that we all thought were science fiction, which is flexible screens and things you put it, doesn't seem quite so far away anymore. I mean, if you look at the iPad, the Nook, and the Kindle side by side, they're all, they're all still really different, right? I mean, the Kindle, it's a great black and white reading experience. The, the, the Nook is a color experience, could be easy to do video on that. And the iPad is maybe the best of the three in terms of interface, but it's a little heavy and hurts your wrist after a while. So, you know, nobody believes that we've gotten to a place where from a device standpoint, we're at the end of the road and we've figured it all out. But what I believe and what I want, you know, it's the end of a busy three days and I wanted to just kind of leave you with something to chew on is, I believe you, perhaps more than any other room on earth, have the power to think about the ideas that matter in the world and move them forward into this new device or this new set of devices. Um, I was in with a publisher the other day who will remain nameless, but it's a big publishing house, and I said what I thought was a softball question. I said, imagine, if you will, what editorial looks like in three years on a reader device. And he looked at me and said, I have no idea. And I thought, that's not a good, I mean, I can come up with, it's you know, connected, it's live, it's, I mean, you can make up a hundred answers to that. But when he said, I have no idea, I thought to myself, well, wouldn't that be the fun part? I mean, wouldn't the fun part be imagining the world we're gonna move into in which all these ideas come alive and at the end of the day, publishers become not less important, but more important, not less influential, but more influential. Readers say, you know what? I only want things to come to me that are curated through people that I trust. Because that thing we started the talk with when I asked you to raise your hand, I mean, we all know that that's not sustainable, right? We all know that waking up in the morning with 200 emails in your inbox of various BCCs and ridiculous ads and nonsense is not an experience we want to continue with. So we're going to start looking for trusted curators, and I would argue that some of them are in the room today. Um, before I wrap, I want to just kind of close this by saying there are pieces of technology out there that are beginning to think about curation in a remarkable way. I wrote about some of them in the book, although the irony, of course, is that the book was delivered in August, and three of them didn't exist until December. So, you know, I'll continue to update the material on the website, and I'll continue to tell the story of curation. One of them, which I'm very proud of, is a piece of technology that I work with day in and day out, seven days a week, a company that I built three years ago and continue to breathe life into and, and see go to the next level, uh, which is a company called Magnify. And, and Magnify really believes that publishers are going to use a set of tools to become the next generation of curators. And we work today with I mean, lots of publishers who you know um, and more. So with that in mind, I would just say, if you're looking for uh, people who are passionate about curation, there are some of them you'll find on my blog and some of them are in the room today. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Go forth and curate. Thanks.